Right. So, okay. So, why do we have such a strong desire to learn when we've already spent so many hours in classrooms studying our views of learning, whether we are good at it or bad at it, they were formed back in college and school itself. So, here we are going to broaden our understanding of uh, the learning today, what learning entails. Our education is not limited to just the classroom. We learn from events in our everyday life, uh, making decisions, uh, solving issues, and collaborating with others. They're all examples of learning. And learning is the most important aspect of life. It's the key to assisting ourselves and others in reaching their full potential. So we all know that keeping up with the fast changing environment necessitates learning. If, they, if we take a look at the uh, technology, uh, technological advancements that have occurred over time, and if we consider how computers and you know televisions and even cell phones have evolved, the world in fact is evolving at a breakneck pace, at a breakneck speed. And as a result, in order to learn new knowledge, acquire new abilities and attitudes, we upgrade our own operating system. We keep upgrading ourselves and we do it. We do it pretty well. So our learning style is so automatic. It is not something unknown to us. It's very natural that it occurs in the background under our subconscious also. And we do not need an instruction manual for it. So despite this, we are supposed to take classes, learn and do it well. Why should learning anything, learning be, you know, difficult if it's a natural process? So here are a certain questions, just food for thought. Isn't learning something we've always done? How do you know whether you are good or bad at learning? Does the learning extend beyond the classroom? Is it possible to learn how to learn? That is all. Uh, what uh, that is what all of us are attempting to do. Learn how to learn. So here we have a question. Uh, have a poll, which I would like all of you to you know take and answer. I'm just launching that poll. The question is, which kind of learning is more meaningful? There are two or three types of basic learning. There's formal education, incidental, and formal informal education. So you can pick your option and you know take participate in this poll it's just to you know know your opinion on what kind of learning you think is more uh, meaningful more useful so i've already started uh, the poll if you would you know just vote okay i can see that people are voting Nine people have voted so far. I request all of you to please participate in this. Okay, I'm ending the poll. So here, eight percent people present here. They think formal learning is more meaningful, and eighty-three percent think uh, incidental or informal learning is more useful and there's a small uh, portion of people around eight person who say they cannot decide which one is more you know uh, powerful so i'll just share the results also with all of you i hope you can see it on your screens before we advance to the next section okay so now that we've discussed a little bit about learning, we'll uh, come to uh, what is experiential learning. Before learning how to implement it in the classroom, we need to know what experiential learning is exactly. And since we have so many educators here, teachers and facilitators here, I hope all of you already know what experiential learning is. If you want to share something about it, something that you know about experiential learning, please feel free and uh, please type it in the chat pod. It would, it would be great to make this session, you know, more interactive, kindly participate. So if you have any idea about what experiential learning is, in just a simple one sentence, you can, you know, type in the chat form. Okay. So as the name suggests, uh, experiential learning involves learning from experience. Experience is the source of learning and development. And put it, to put it in simple words, experiential learning is actually learning uh, by doing. We do things and we learn. I am sure most of you had, have heard about it. Like I, I have a quote from Confucius here. He says, I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, and I do I understand. So all these things, you know, make up experiential learning. You hear, you see things, you uh, re uh, reflect on things, and you understand things. 
so no one shows us how to walk or talk we learn it by practicing and you know developing our technique experiential learning helps us to grow personal understanding knowledge abilities and attitudes uh, via the examination and reflection on activities that we perform actions that we perform and the best part is that it is applicable to people from different walks of life in a variety of scenarios irrespective of their age education exper experience skill background culture whatever so here uh, again i'm going to launch a poll i know i am asking a lot of uh, questions uh, to you at the very start but it's important for me to you know just uh, for it to decide the course of uh, this webinar so i'll just launch poll to okay i'm not able to do it from here So I have another question for you. When implementing an experiential activity, I hope uh, you, all of you know what an experiential activity is. The teacher must make sure it is more learner-centered, teacher-centered, curriculum-centered, society-centered, or all of the above. Or what is your opinion on this? Please vote. Okay, I have responses here. People are responding. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll now, and I have the results here. So, 67% people think that it is learner-centered, and 33% uh, people think all of the above. It should be teacher-centered, curriculum-centered, society-centered as uh, well. So, we'll discover the answer as we go through, you know, uh, through the course of this webinar. So, I'll just share the results with all of you on your screen, and you can view it yourself. Okay. So before we start discussing in detail what uh, experiential learning is, what are its characteristics, and how you know Paul, Dr. Cole developed the experiential learning theory, we'll just you know glance through the uh, differences between experiential learning and the traditional approach you know that we uh, usually use in schools. So in the traditional approach of uh, learning, which is a theoretical uh, experiential learning, basically brings a different theoretical perspective in contrast to the traditional, you know, educational methods. In educational, uh, in experiential learning, the focus is on the learning process rather than the outcomes. Learning efficacy, according to behavioral conceptualizations, is measured by the quantity of facts or actions that a person has learned in response to the stimulating questions that the teachers put up and these mental parts of concepts they are not changeable they cannot be changed and the purpose is to acquire more and more of them that is how traditional you know educational methods work ideas according to experiential learning they are not fixed they change and reform they form and reform as a result of experience because each time the experience is different the ideas also have to be different experiential learning focuses on long term behavioral change the development of skills and behaviors to adapt to various situations and the ability to use this knowledge. So learning in this case is uh, dependent on uh, where the participant is at present, what is his relationship to what has happened before and where they want to be in future. Another thing uh, that experiential learning uh, has an advantage of over traditional approach that it is a learning process which is based on experience which is grounded in experience so implementing testing analyzing refining ideas uh, based on previous experience experiences does not provide an opportunity for learning experience must challenge expectations it should be different so that you know people go ahead and reflect on it so education entails both refining and changing old concepts as well as implanting new ones so the onus of utilizing the experience and modifying the instructions accordingly it lies on the shoulders of the teachers, the facilitators. Then again, learning in experiential learning is a transactional process. So here the transaction is taking between the learner and the environment. It is here the learner and the environment are engaging in a transaction because the information is the outcome of testing and refining hypothesis rather than you know learning by rote methods. The experience and knowledge gained can be applied in a broader context here. Yeah. So in order to un fully understand what experiential learning is, we must also understand what experiential learning is 
not. Okay. I'm not able to change the slide here. Okay. Sorry. Sorry for that. So experiential uh, learning differs from conventional academic instruction. In experiential learning, the students manage their own learning rather than being told what to do and when to do it. So the relationship between the student and instructor is different with the instructor, you know, passing off uh, much of the responsibility onto the students. Right, so the context for learning here is different. It may not take place in the classroom. And there may be no textbooks or academic texts also to study. The curriculum itself may not be identified clearly. The student may have to identify the knowledge they require and then acquire it themselves, reflecting on their learning as they go along. So experiential learning isn't about scribbling fresh information on your mind's blank slate. It is not about the act of memorizing and it is not, not at all a passive process. It's a very active process you know, learning process that engages and invites participation from the learner. The experiential learning we are going to talk about in today's session is a little different from the self-managed experiential learning that we practice almost every day. So in order to understand what it is, let's understand uh, the code's uh, experiential learning theory from which it is derived. So here I have a quote also from Dr. Cole. I hope most of you know about him and his experiential learning theory. So I have another poll for you all here, which I'm going to launch. And I request all of you to please participate in it. Right. Uh, so the question is, do you think that the outcomes of the learning process should be varied and unpredictable for the learners uh, for it to play a critical role in assessing their own learning? If you think it's yes, uh, you can pick your option. No also. And then people who cannot say anything can have an option for that also. Right, so I think we have our four results. Some of the people are still voting. All right, so we have our poll results with us. So there are 72 people, 72 percent people who say yes. They think that the outcomes of the learning process should be unpredictable so that the learners, you know, can assess their own learning. Then 28 percent disagree with it. Right, I'll share the results with you all also. So these are the results here. So we'll discover as we, you know, go along what it, this actually means, how this, you know, actually transforms. So here we have a called experiential learning model or, and we are going to deconstruct it. So I just use a little, uh, uh, I just ex try to explain it in a very simple way for those who are uninitiated, those who already have an idea, I think they'll be able to understand it better. So although a broad idea of experiential learning was always around for a, a very long time, it was uh, David Paul uh, who constructed and developed the first formal experiential learning theory that was back in 1984. And he's an American psychologist and educational theorist who was born in 1939 and he's living in Ohio at present. His theory was explicitly uh, based on the works of John Piaget and John Dewey, Kurt Lewin's principles. They talk a lot about reflection uh, being a part of, you know, learning how, it, how you have, you know, they talk about the principles of concrete experiences, abstract concepts, feedback, reflection, and application. And Kolb has uh, kind of, you know, uh, combined all of them to come up with this theory. So the experiential learning theory, uh, ELT that we call it, and the Kolb Learning Style Inventory are two of uh, his uh, noteworthy contributions to teaching and learning. So experiential learning is a method for generating knowledge from various combinations of grasping and changing experiences or transforming experiences. So here he says that concrete experience and abstract conception are two ways in which we can grasp an experience in which we can you know, have an experience. And people can then modify their experience in one of two ways. They can either reflect on it or actively experiment with it. So both uh, grasping and transformation has been covered. So this procedure of grasping and transformation is depicted as a cycle. You can also understand it uh, this way. 
as learners when we are engaged in a very practical activity we often uh, reflect on what we said or did in a particular session during or after the activity that reflection might result in new ideas or conclusions about learning we think what happened right so uh, learning that uh, you know enables us to adjust our approach to the future so this is something that we can do in a cyclical way aim that improving we do something we think about it we draw some conclusions about it and based on those conclusions we change and then of course we do it again and again to see what happens as a result of our adaptations and then we think about that new experience and then we draw new conclusions and maybe change again so this process is a simplified version of uh, the experiential uh, learning theory which david paul bah has you know proposed so according to him it is a concrete experience which provides information and that can be used as a foundation for a reflection reflective observation and we integrate the information and construct abstract uh, concepts uh, as a result of these reflections we then use these ideas to create a new world hypothesis which are again which we put into active experimentation or we put to, put it to the test we obtain information through experience through the testing of our ideas and we cycle back again to the beginning of the process so however uh, according to pope experience isn't required to start the procedure he doesn't say you have to start the procedure from here on instead uh, he says that each person must determine which learning mode will be effective most effective in a given setting according to him the the learner is they must possess four abilities uh, you know in order to be productive sorry skip this slide so these are the four abilities so the first one is the concrete experience abilities uh, which where the learner you know fully immerses uh, himself in the new situation then we have the reflective observation abilities where they consider and observe from a variety of angles then you have the abstract conceptualization abilities where they develop con uh, conceptions you know concepts that incorporate their findings into sound hypotheses and then comes active experimentation abilities uh, where they make judgments and solve problems using theory so these are the four uh, different abilities <clears throat> that we have here so again there's a bold question that i have uh, for you here i'm going to launch it by uh, sorry i think it's still sharing the previous poll results so i have another poll for you all so that we can you know uh, discover the answer to our discussion further the question is uh, do you think the way someone best consumes information can be a deciding factor in their academic success so as you can see uh, poll you know has uh, given out four abilities so there are going to be four types of learners depending upon those abilities so do you think the way someone you know consumes information it can be a deciding factor in their academic success can see that people are still voting okay so i'm going to end the poll now and share the results with you all so there are 58% who think that you know the way someone best consumes information can decide their academic success while 25% disagree with it and 17% cannot decide okay i hope you'll be able to decide after this session thank you, thank you so much i'll just stop sharing the results of the poll then right. coming back to our learning abilities and uh, dr pope so dr pope's approach is unique uh, in that while it is a spiral of learning you can begin with any of the four abilities it's not necessary to begin from here or here or here so it go it is obviously ideal to begin with a tangible concrete experience he also says that so according to him children develop a predilection for learning in a certain style from the very beginning you know from a very early age so in different contexts students may use different learning styles but they tend to prefer certain learning behaviors over others and each level is most likely to be encountered in varied degrees by a student but he or she may demonstrate a preference for one of the abilities so this favored ability is the basis for pope's learning style inventory he distinguishes four learning styles and 
these are his uh, four learning styles as you can uh, see on the screen and each of these styles is linked to a different approach to problem solving so two of the four key steps of the learning cycle that we saw earlier are defined by strengths in each of the four learning styles so two of them are there in each of the learning styles so people who learn best through abstract conceptualization and you know uh, active experimentation this side so they have a convergent learning style they are convergers they use hypothetical deductive reasoning a lot then we have concrete experience and thoughtful observation so such people who have a divergent learning style and these people look at things from a variety of angles and rely significantly on you know brainstorming and development of ideas they have the ability to create theoretical models and then we have assimilators assimilators again abstract conception and introspective observations are related with this style and it is uh, uh, used uh, by assimilators they are called assimilators and they uh, use a lot of inductive reasoning here then we have concrete experience and active experimentation which are linked to the accommodating learning style here and these accommodators are those who carry out plans and experiments uh, while all the while adapting to changing conditions also it is a difficult job also so uh, these are accommodators so the individual's learning style uh, can be determined by his or her abilities environment and learning history uh, when it comes to learning new things experiential learning can be beneficial in allowing people to discover their own abilities the notion uh, explains how students can play to their strengths while still improving in areas where they are la lacking you know and then here again we can you know reflect and go back to the slide where we discussed experiential uh, learning versus traditional learning so experiential learning theory differs from uh, cognitive and behavioral theories uh, in the sense that cognitive theories emphasize mental processes while behavior uh, behavioral theories they overlook the relevance of subjective experience in the whole uh, process of learning so experiential learning according to cole but comprises of six main characteristics it's a, a lifelong process based on personal experience the learning should be viewed as a process rather than a set of outcomes then it necessitates resolving conflicts it's a holistic process of uh, world adaptation then it entails interactions between a person and their environment their surroundings and learning is a process of uh, generating new information as a result of the interaction of you know social and personal knowledge so now uh, we come to our next section of this webinar but before that i have another poll for all of you and um, there no there aren't very uh, too many questions here uh, but uh, still okay so i am going to launch the next poll i hope all of you can see it on your screens okay so the question is do you think that an experiential learning approach that we just talked about helps the learner develop a commitment to make the best use of learning the learner can commit to you know make the best use of whatever he's learned if yes you can select that otherwise there are the options as well there right so i have my poll results here there's people who are still voting so we'll just wait a few more seconds for them so 100% people think that experiential learning approach helps the learners you know commit to make the best use of their learning i also agree with that okay i'm going to share the results with you all right okay so uh, the next section is about extending expanding the experiential learning model in the classroom so how do you design an experience in such a way that it allows for experiential learning what does experiential learning really look like so experiential learning ideas they emerged in the mid 19th century uh, when you know people wanted to shift from uh, shift away from traditional formal education 
in which facilitators simply presented students with abstract concepts and learning was more immersive. So in experiential learning, as we discussed earlier, students learn by doing. They apply what they have learned to real world situations in order to build new abilities of, or ways of thinking. Not only this, but experiential learning is based on the interdisciplinary and con constructivist learning principles also. Interdisciplinary in the sense that the uh, experiential approach, it uh, tries to establish an integrative learning environment, an environment which uh, replicates the real world learning. It does not treat each subject as if it were isolated, you know, disconnected from the rest of the group. Uh, something that we call compartmentalized learning and constructivist in the sense that learning process outcomes are variable, as was one of the questions earlier in the poll. The learning process outcomes, they are variable and they're frequently, you know, unpredictable. The experience has to be challenging, uh, as I said earlier. And learners have a significant role in judging their own learning. So how one student approaches an issue will always differ from how another one approaches it. And what one student takes away from an experience will always differ from the, from how, you know, what, or what others take away from it. So uh, we're discussing how experiential learning should look like. I have a few points here. So the open nature of experiential learning means that it can, you know, often be difficult to define what is and what is not an experiential activity, but it all, depends upon how it is executed. It all depends upon the executions. The very first characteristic that I have here is that it should be an amalgamation of content and process. There must be balance between the experiential you know, activities and the underlying uh, content or theory. Then there should be absence of excess and judgment in the sense that the instructor must create a safe space for students to work through their own process of self-discovery. And engagement in pur purposeful endeavors uh, in experiential learning, the learner is the self-teacher. Therefore, there must be meaning for the student in the learning. The learning activities must be personally relevant to the students. And then the big picture perspective comes when experiential activities, you know, they allow the students to make connections between the learning they're doing and the real world. The learning potential of each experience has to be carefully considered here, whether they provide opportunities for uh, students to practice and deepen, you know, their skills, emergent skills, uh, encounter new and unpredictable situations that support new learning or learn from natural consequences, mistakes, successes, whatever is there. And then comes a very important part of experiential learning, which is reflection. And uh, here we are going to discuss uh, the role of reflection in uh, experiential learning. Students should be able to reflect on their own learning and gain an insight into them and their interactions with the world. So reflection on learning should occur both during the activity, during the events and after the events. Analysis, critical thinking, synthesis, they are all products of the reflection. They are not reflection. We can't call them reflection. So reflection happens and then analysis, critical thinking and synthesis happen. So the next point is creating emotional investment. Students must be fully immersed in the experience. Uh, it shouldn't be that, you know, they are doing it just for the sake of doing it, just because it is required of them. They should be mentally, emotionally, socially, and even physically, if possible, you know, giving the impression that the learning task is genuine. Then comes the re-examination of values where students can try to analyze and even alter their own values by working within that safe space that you've created for them for self-exploration. Then the mean, uh, presence of meaningful relationships to their uh, should be there. One part, you know, of getting students to see their learning in the context of the whole world is to start by showing the relationships between the learner to self, learner to others, and learner to world relationships, how they should be formed and, you know, how they should be sustained. Then learning outside one's perceived uh, comfort zones. So the learner should be challenged to take initiative, should come out of his comfort zone, you know, take initiative, make uh, decisions, and he should be accountable for the results, you know, uh, results that happen throughout the process of experiential learning. But they should be actively engaged in posing questions, uh, investigating, experimenting, being curious, and, you know, solving problems, assuming responsibilities, and being creative and constructing also. So learning is enhanced when uh, students are given the opportunity 
to operate outside you know their perceived comfort zones so that is how experiential learning looks like so we usually uh, as uh, teachers and educators you might already have an idea uh, of the different uh, types of experiential learning they are basically broadly of two types one are field based experiences and one is a classroom based learning which most of you might have practiced also so field based learning is quite an old and established form uh, and it includes internships you know cooperative education service learning and all classroom based experiential learning is very versatile it includes role plays games case studies you know simulations presentations and uh, a lot of group work various types of group work so as a facilitator how should you begin what is your role in experiential learning uh, that is very uh, important you know how to get started how to plan to incorporate experiential learning activities so when beginning to think about Uh, uh you know incorporating an experiential component into your class there are several uh things you can you know uh consider there are several things uh, you can uh you know think about one of them is analyzing and determining the needs of your uh, learners what is the grade level of your students what are their current content mastery levels uh, what cultural demands or variations do they have so we must recognize that the students you know they were raised in a different uh, setting all of them come from a different background also and that can have an impact on their interactions and the second thing that we uh, need to take care to consider is determine which activities are appropriate for your learners and uh, what kind of course or material or concept is appropriate for them what kind of activities are suitable for your course topic and what uh, activities fit the cognitive development needs of your you know learners which areas of your course's content can be enhanced through experiential learning how does the activity you're considering you know meets your uh, course's uh, objectives how does it allow students to have an uh, have a hands on experience you know what is the relationship between the activity and the program's curriculum so all these questions should be carefully considered once you decide to implement experiential learning into your class you decide to begin it begin it the third and very important point is when incorporating experiential learning you have to look for potential difficulties also what will be the road blocks uh, what compromises will you have to make in order to integrate an experiential learning activity in your course uh, will you have to sacrifice some content a uh, time for that time uh, that you have put your aside for you know content uh, while you are developing and updating a course and how will the activity fit into the overall program curriculum is there any institutional support as your school supporting as your institution supporting you uh, for substituting experiential activities for regular course content and what are the liability concerns what are the same concerns how will the students be positioned do you have the required infrastructure for it where is the material going to come from so all uh, these uh, road blocks will have to be thought about you know and listed in one place so once i mean you've answered all these questions you may be ready to implement experiential learning in your classroom so i have another poll question here since we are uh, talking about experiential learning a lot and projects are a main part of experiential learning so i'm going to launch this poll and i request all of you to please answer it the question is do you think projects are more meaningful than tests so if somebody wants to share anything in the chat pod they are most welcome if they want to share their ideas about it about these questions about experiential learning you can please use the chat pod extensively and you know uh, type in your comments there okay so we have the poll results here there are some people who are still voting all right we just close the poll and share the results with you so there are 92% people who think that projects are more meaningful than tests there is there are 8% people who think that you know and they are not and uh, yes there are no indecisive people amongst us so i'm sharing the poll results with you yeah okay 
Right. So projects are more meaningful than tests because students must think, plan, and you know execute their ideas to produce something from their own creativity. There's a sense of belonging. That's my personal opinion. Right. Uh, continuing with the implementation part of experiential learning in the uh, classroom. So we come to the designing of experiential activities. As I uh, said earlier, you have to decide, you know, whether an activity is experiential or not. Uh, it depends upon a lot of uh, things. So how? Uh, so it isn't the particular activity that is experiential. It is the way that it is framed that can make it experiential. You can make any activity experiential just by reframing it, you know, designing it in such a way. So students can. Uh, process real life circumstances, experiment with new behaviors and receive feedback in, in, a, in a particular environment and experiential classroom. So experiential learning activities, they help students in connecting theory to practice and analyzing real world situations in light of course content. So a general framework of making, you know, uh, instructional activities experiential, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, it can be as I've listed in front of you. There are some points that I've listed down in the slides. The first one is determine which sections of your course can be better taught through experiential learning. You can consider how any proposed activities they relate to the learning objectives of the course. Then also consider how the proposed activity will fit into your overall course of study, fit into your lesson plan also. And then consider the appropriate grading criteria, the evaluation criteria for the planned activity. So after you have, you know, uh, identified a suitable activity, it must be correctly framed in order to be fully experienced. To begin, you can think on issues to solve rather than, you know, facts to retain. So activities, projects, uh, field experiences, they can be linked with a topic or inquiry. And this ensures that the learning process incorporates both thinking and doing so next thing you can consider is the combination of primary and secondary experiences uh, within the same you know uh, academic program so original experiences are uh, the experienced activities themselves they are the primary experiences while secondary experiences uh, such as reflection are the result of the primary experiences so if students are not given the opportunity to reflect on primary experiences and as, as well as you know opportunities to apply information from secondary experiences and learning may be lost uh, the mix of primary and secondary experiences may vary depending on what classes you are teaching what kind of learners a learner group you have so lower uh, grades uh, students from lower grades for example they may need to start with uh, primary experiences because they haven't had the opportunity to accumulate any experience. Students in higher grades may have a variety of fundamental you know, experiences on which they can reflect at the outset. And uh, having said that, they might harbor a lot of misconceptions also, which we may need to remove before you know, we begin any activity. So here we have to create an appropriate framework to support the activities, initiate the establishment of an effective experiential learning environment for students to clearly define educational parameters, whether it's a group work, activity learning goals, big picture design plan, whatever. It has to be clearly, you know, uh, delineated to the students. Another thing that is very important while, you know, designing an experiential activity, very important part of this framework is practicing the pattern of inquiry. Pattern of inquiry plays a major role in helping uh, structured classroom experiential activities. Uh, the fact that, you know, thinking occurs not only after an experience, but also throughout the event when the event is taking place. It is one of the reasons why this pattern of inquiry is so powerful. The process starts with a student asking a question about difficulty. Then the student, uh, again, uh, after that devises a strategy for dealing with the problem. Then it, he tests it again against reality and then utilizes uh, what uh, you know he or she has learned to come up with a solution. The application of knowledge is the experiential component here. So whenever employing uh, the inquiry pattern to implement an activity, uh, should always keep in mind that the activity should be student centered. That was also one of the questions you know the uh, poll earlier. So it has to be student uh, centered. The activity should be hands on. And it should require children to tackle a problem that you know they can relate to. 
So uh, if you've ha ever had a chance to go through the worksheets that are provided with our experiential learning program and you know our new program in uh, Be Curious also, the Yelp and Be Curious programs, you uh, would uh, you know understand what uh, I am trying to say when I mean what by uh, what I mean by you know when, when I say pattern of inquiry, because uh, uh, the whole uh, it is an inquiry based process that is followed in those sheets. Even if you've had a chance to go through gizmos and the exploration sheets that you have with our uh, virtual lab simulations, with that program gizmos that also has an inquiry based you know pattern of questioning which helps the uh, children you know to discover and uh, to reflect on the experience and you know discover the concepts themselves right so here uh, there are a few uh, tips you know if you're an instructor uh, facilitator there are a few tips that uh, you know can help instructors to start thinking about this whole process of implementing experiential learning holistically in a classroom so uh, the very first thing is use a major project or task to guide learning over the entire course. So if, uh, like I said earlier, uh, the few of our products, you know, which deal with uh, uh, the inquiry based process because Yardstick is, an, uh, is a pioneer in experiential learning. So our products not only take into consideration the pattern of inquiry, but here also, if you would have, you know, had the chance to look at our new uh, computer science curriculum product, Qubits, we have, a, with each course, we have a major, you know, project which is done uh, in parts and, you know, eventually it is completed. But along with that, you know, it is also uh, necessary to use a combination of small projects, classroom activities and external experiences to keep the course interesting and, you know, engaging. So firstly, it is uh, to use a major project or task to guide learning over the entire course. So it motivates uh, students to, you know, keep moving forward. It gives them a clear goal to focus on. And it actually becomes a driving force behind everything that the student does in class. So when students know what they are aiming towards, they understand that each class has a purpose because it provides a stepping stone towards that overall you know, aim. And uh, again, as I told you, you have to use a combination of projects, classroom activities uh, to keep the course interesting and engaging and also uh, so that they add value to the overall process. Then it has to be tied together. You have to tie everything together. The class activities should all be thought of as resources that will help the students complete their major project. Then you have to ensure that activities are challenging and at the same time they are manageable also they shouldn't get out of control out of hand so when students are given the responsibility of devising their own projects the instructor must then make sure that they are able to complete them so you have texters to provide them a clear expectation set a clear expectations for the students and this can include the assessment criteria or you know examples of certain completed projects from previous courses activities from previous courses next is to allow students necessary time to identify clarify and keep focused on their problem the most important thing here is that the students are working on projects that are meaningful and relevant to them so they should not lack interest because of the time factor if they lack interest the learning will also be lacking uh, student interest is paramount, it is uh, critical. They must be able to design their activity and still at the same time not feel as if, uh, as if you know, it has been assigned to them. Uh, like someone said, projects are more meaningful than tests because students must think, plan and execute their ideas to generate something from their own creativity. So here are some key uh, things that we have to keep in uh, mind when we are you know, implementing uh, experiential learning in classrooms. First is the value of being able to make mistakes. <clears throat> Students are used to being penalized when they make mistakes in an experiential learning classroom. Uh, facilitators must work hard to eradicate that stigma that is associated with mistakes. You know, They should uh, openly celebrate uh, these things as learning opportunities and not penalize students. Allowing kids to make mistakes may lead to a situation in which they retain more information since the learning process is more demanding. They might not retain information otherwise. So uh, it is okay to do mistakes. It is okay to allow them to make mistakes and we should celebrate their uh, mistakes in fact. 
the next thing is the importance of personal relevance. Find out what interests the students and choose problems that are relevant to them. Something that they can relate to. So when students' uh, attention is generated uh, within rather than, you know, outside, they become emotionally and in intellectually invested in the learning process. Uh, next is the importance of uh, students understanding why they are uh, doing something. If a student does not understand the purpose of their project or why they are involved, they may not learn anything at all. Then next is the significance of connecting uh, students to appropriate activities because the means are just as essential as the outcomes in experiential learning. It is critical that students stay engaged throughout the process. Too little challenge can lead to boredom. Too much challenge can lead to frustration. In either case, engagement and learning both will suffer. Then we have the value of uh, students reflecting on their own experiences. Well, this is uh, a very important phase and this phase is linked to the one before it, that is reflection, as well as driving questions from the instructor, which will help you know students maintain interest, learn well and accomplish their objectives. So the instructor here is playing the role of a facilitator. He's facilitating learning for them. Then we have the significance of the instructor delegating authority to the students. So instead of acting as a leader, the instructor here in experiential learning classroom acts as a guide and a resource for the students. So this does not imply that instructors, you know, they give up all their power, relinquish their power and deny their authority. Instead, they should use the respective power they have at the start of the class to empower the students can be used that way. So what exactly is uh, the role of the instructor? We've talked about, you know, how you can begin before beginning an experiential uh, activity in your classroom. What do you have to think about? How can you implement that? What are, how can you do it holistically? So here we are going to discuss a bit uh, of the uh, role of the instructor. You know, uh, we are going to uh, place it in proper points and uh, discuss, discuss it uh, once again. So the role of the instructor is uh, here in an experiential classroom is much different than it is in a traditional classroom. In the experiential classroom, the instructor is a guide, is a cheerleader, is a resource, is a support, because students must take control of their own learning. So the instructor must work to become an integral member of this group that is evolving. So there are some critical questions, you know, to be asked here uh, when, if, you're, if you're a facilitator. So you must ask yourself, whose experience is it? Whose definition of success is being used here? What is the goal of the activity for the student? And how invested are you in, you know, guaranteeing a certain student outcome? So the teacher's role encompasses uh, informed decisions. Students must understand what they're getting into in order to make informed decisions. Uh, those description, as I told earlier, also should be a detailed introduction should be provided by the instructor. If there are any misconceptions, they should be removed. Then a clear vision should be established. Instructors must give a you know, clear structure and concentration and a clear vision by presenting course objectives to the students and what they should expect you know, from such an endeavor. The instructor should provide direction and set a model initially itself for future classes. If you have previous models, you have previous works, you can show it to them. Then the instructor should set ground rules. Very, this is very important. The instructor must have established a safety net for the pupils, you know, by stating the, and modeling the fundamental operational principles. This empowers them to take chances. The use uh, of I statements to convey feelings, active listening, inclusive language, constructive feedback, and you know, intolerance of operations. There are some potential ground rules. Then facilitating uh, the development of appropriate capabilities. So students require the appropriate abilities, uh, you know, in order to become a part of collaborative projects in their work. So whether in class groups or as a part of teams within placements, these. Uh, uh, abilities are to be related to the students and the way that you can develop these capabilities are also given here. They have to think as a group, think as a team player in order to come up with what they want to learn. Students should be introduced to, you know, a brainstorming and, you know, strategizing. 
then decision making is another ability where you know you can explain uh, decision making and help students test it out by starting with small decisions and that then you know they gradually grow more complex you can talk about leadership to ensure all students can practice being leaders the instructor you know as an instructor you can point out many potential leadership roles you can have roles inside uh, the activity itself so one person can be a you know group collective conscious another can be a question framer an interrogator or a summarizer then another ability is problem solving which provides students with opportunities here you have to provide students with opportunities to solve simple problems you know at the beginning and then they will help them refine their skills so that later on in future they are able to solve more complex problems the next is uh, feedback and reflection again very important reflection is a very important part of the whole process and here again in order uh, for students to develop uh, this particular ability because, uh, because evaluation and reflection are, are a crucial component of experiential learning the instructor here must ensure that feedback you know occurs at uh, different times and a debriefing occurs at different times there's brainstorming there's a lot of discussion uh you know that occurs so there should be quality feedback time that should be you know put aside for uh feedbacks and debriefing in each of these activities right so we are i'm sure i have taken a lot of time but we are still going to discuss some best practices here uh you know teaching strategies then that can help students learn more reflectively and experientially so the first one the very first one is pause as i told you time is crucial time for the activity is crucial feedback time is crucial reflection time is crucial uh, similarly pausing is crucial when lecturing the facilitator the instructor should wait between sentences to allow students to reflect on and ask questions about what they have just heard or learned then second is uh the misconceptions addressing their misconceptions confronting learners with their misconceptions learners are assisted if their misconceptions are you know identified and they are not left then and there they are pursued to the finish they are not only corrected but it is made sure that they have been corrected and they have been you know eradicated they have been removed then we have concept maps uh, another uh, strategy you know that can uh, help students learn experientially you can ask these learners your learners to build a concept map to understand how they see a topic how they perceive a topic the variances in each learner's map you know will reveal differences in how they think and uh, you know uh, the material on which uh, then you can identify the material on which to reflect so concept maps are again very helpful here and then asking the learners to explain and apply asking students to describe a subject and then apply it to something else that can also help you figure out which kids you know have mastered critical thinking and reflection abilities and which ones have not and furthermore uh, just to quote a very famous scientist here if learners are aware that they will be expected to explain something they are more likely to take a thorough approach to studying it and uh, next is questioning so when it comes to experiential learning the types of questions used in class and examinations are very important again i would like to take you back to where i mentioned the inquiry based process pattern of inquiry and uh, the, if you want to see how it is like you can you know view some of our worksheets uh, that we use for our uh, experiential learning program and you know be curious so questioning is questions posed as problems to examine uh you know i hope i am audible okay wait right. thank you so sorry for that interruption so we were talking about questioning so when it comes to experiential learning the types of questions Uh, that we ask are very important open questions as i was telling you uh, leading questions and questions posed as problems to examine uh, they are all good approaches you know to make them think about things so and it's often the simplest question which are the most difficult to answer and they demand the most thought 
so looking at questions from that perspective i think can help uh, us you know uh, uh, understand experience and how to implement experiential learning activities in our class more we can use those questions here so once uh, students have been provided with the necessary skills and information the instructor then can take a step back you know and act as a resource just a facilitator because experiential learning frequently pushes students beyond their comfort zones the instructor must assist them in developing confidence during the process someone needs to point out that their problems are a crucial part of their growth towards achievement the instructor should put a positive spin on all the complex obstacles you know they, they should have faith in the pupils and the instructor himself or herself should be enthusiastic about the whole process they should create support and model a safe environment where the students you know feel valued they feel trusted and respected we should remind the students that they are in charge of their own learning and here is where empowerment comes they should empower them to use their authority to empower them to make important decisions and model each behavior in a number of ways to ensure that you know the concepts are thoroughly grasped uh, grasped and processed so finally when uh, bringing the experiential learning process when the whole activity is to be brought to a close when you have to bring it to the close the educators they can create a sense of finality also so the instructor should assist the students in you know understanding what they have accomplished during the entire activity that sense of accomplishment should also be there so instructors can help students achieve closure by asking for written and verbal self evaluation and uh, you know supporting a closure celebration kind of a thing so uh concluding this uh, workshop we'll be discussing some of the benefits uh, of experiential education although i don't have to tell you most of us are aware of the benefits but still uh, we'll just uh, discuss some of them so as you all know that yardstick is a pioneer in experiential learning so here are uh, some results of a research that was done by yardstick in partnership uh, partnership with some schools and it was to assess how effective is experiential learning as compared to other methods of learning or other methods that the teachers have been practicing so it was observed that the higher order thinking skills such as you know evaluation analyzation and application they were considerably high for students who were engaged with ex uh, in experiential learning because they were using our uh, uh, program which is be curious a new program of experiential learning called be curious those resources they were using and it was uh, these high order thinking skills were uh, you know considerably high for these students so as you can see here the blue ones were using be curious and uh, the red ones were not using be curious and this is the result in front of you uh, how you know experiential uh, education how experiential learning actually benefits students and this data has not randomly been picked up some evaluations and assessments were performed along with the schools and that is how we have obtained this data i just wanted to show you this so uh, how uh, do the students you know uh, what benefits do students obtain by participating in uh, experiential learning opportunities so they get a better grasp of the course material they have a broader perspective on the world and a sense of belonging as well they have a better understanding of their own abilities interests passions and values they have collaboration opportunities with a wide range of individuals they have professional skill sets that are beneficial the satisfaction of helping to meet a community's demand they have self assurance and leadership abilities as well so these are some of the benefits that i've listed down here of experiential learning so experiential learning is an active process in which the learner participates rather than you know a passive one in which the to which the learner is subjected to the experience experience provides the platform for learning and experiential learning while thorough examination and reflection of the experience produces the learning so individuals are encouraged to figure out things for themselves and rather than being taught they are directed to uh, through their and through their learning you know they are directed to their learning and they are taken through their learning so individuals produce learning that is suitable most suitable to them best suited for them the concepts uh assume that there are no proper ways of thinking set no set norms no ideal behaviors that anyone must learn and use they devise their own you know ways of thinking they devise their own norms their own behaviors here so it is the learners commitment to make the greatest use of learning they are 
at the center of the learning process, uh, which we call the experiential learning process. So with this, I uh, conclude today's presentation and we have the question and answer session now. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box. If you're having any problem typing, you can also uh, raise your hand. We'll unmute you and you can ask your question. questions. So no questions for uh, today. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, Minakshi, you are. And uh, I think it's pretty clear. I think everyone understood very clearly. I hope so. <laughs> right then, uh, we'll uh, conclude the session then. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Minakshi, for this uh, wonderful session. Thank and, you. Um, I would uh, request all of you to uh, look up on our website as we have a few more uh, workshops coming up uh, for the next few uh, weeks. And this is the next one, uh, STEM projects using simulations. And um, we hope that you will register and join us for that session. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.